they are the fabulous learning nerds. Cause if you're tired of the old ways of getting it done, you've got the fabulous learning nerds. Scott, Dan, and Abby are making it fun. The best ideas that you've ever heard. So everybody spread the word. They're gonna keep you with turning the fabulous learning nerds. Fabulous learning nerds. Hey everybody, welcome back to another fantastic episode of your Fabulous Learning Nerds. I'm Scott Shooty, your host, and with us, he, the legend is back, Dan Coonrod, everybody. Dan, Wait, me? man. Daniel! I'm, I'm the legend? The legend. I think you have to probably set the bar a little bit higher for the word legend around here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, seriously, I think you're, you're I mean, we were just telling campfire Aww. stories about you. Uh huh. That's right. So afraid. Yeah. Remember that time when Dan <laughs> moved that mountain. Remember when Dan slayed the army of orcs. Are we talking like Dungeons and Dragons stories? We we're no. We were talking like real stories, but we were comparing them to mythical stories because oh, okay. that's what you do. That's that's good storytelling. Aww. Right? You understand that? We should Aww. do an episode on storytelling. How you doing, Dan? I think you know the answer. I'm fair to fair Midland. To Midland. Right. Okay. That that is awesome. That is fantastic. You're you're uh, moving and shaking in a in a new role, right? I am. I am. I recently uh, shifted to another company, and uh, it is fantastic. Uh, doing lots of new and exciting things, uh, flexing and shaking uh, in ways that uh, I really never have. It's super awesome. Super amazing. Well, that is fantastic. Everybody should enjoy their work experience. I'm super happy for you. Oh, yeah. You said that you will never work for a non-startup ever again. I yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I feel like now that I'm saying it like in a recorded space where it's forever held into like prosperity, that like I'll look back on that line and be like, ah, oh, man, that was dumb. But no, actually, like the as we talk about like what work is and what works becoming in like this new era, everybody wants to feel like their work matters. Everybody wants to feel like their work has purpose and value and is pushing the business. I don't think anybody wants to be lazy. Everybody just wants to know what their contribution is doing. And I never wonder that where I'm at right now. It's new though, but I, I feel pretty strong that it's going to stay that way. That is fantastic. One can only hope. That's the story for all of us. We just want to be seen. We want to be valued. We want to be appreciated. That's a great, great thing. Speaking of being seen, valued, and appreciated, you love her. Abby's in the house. Abby. Hey there. How's it going? Good. I mean, who doesn't love being introduced as being seen, valued, and appreciated? It doesn't get better than that. Still the best drop. <laughs> Any Still better. The best drop. <laughs> Abby giving me tough love this morning. She's an amazing accountability partner, and I love her to death. It's great. Anybody that can look you in the eye and say, yeah, that was dumb, is the best friend <laughs> ever. Like, I need more people like that. I don't need... You know what a flying monkey is, Abby? Um, is it more than a monkey with wings? Um, it is a, um, any individual, now you, you know who the flying monkeys are, right? No. Oh, come on. You've seen the Wizard of Oz, correct? Oh, from like, yes. Yeah, yes. Return to Oz, right? They were spooky in Return to Oz. They were, the, yes. yes. So the Wicked Witch, by the way, the Wicked Witch was in that movie for 11 minutes. That's it. And what an impact she had in 11 minutes of screen time. That's all. Um, I only know this because I watched a, a documentary on it yesterday. It was great. But anyway, <laughs> uh, flying monkeys are people in your life that basically just are yes people and do whatever you want, right? And a lot of not so great people are just surrounded by flying monkeys. It's just amazing. It's like, and flying monkeys do terrible things. Like they'll actually go out and like speak on your behalf. Like, you know, you really hurt so and so's feelings and you really should come back to them and be a really better, better friend. Like it, when you see that, just know that, 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 oh, you're a flying monkey and I just need to ignore you uh, because <laughs> that's what you need to do. So that's awesome. Uh, but Abby's not one of them. Abby's a superheroine. And those are the people that uh, you want in your life um how are you this week i'm good i had a really good week that's so great. 
That's fantastic. Yeah. And and Q1 is over and now we're into Q2 and it's all good. <sighs> yeah. Thank yeah, God. right. We're going to go ahead and take a break. <laughs> Spring break's going on. Hey, folks, we don't have a guest this week. Um, and so we're going to go old school. And the three of us are going to chat about something that Dan found on the internet, which is fantastic. <laughs> so let's go ahead and without further ado, uh, any waste of time, we'll get into our topic of the week. So earlier, I'm like, hey, um, you guys want to just talk about stuff? And everyone was like, yeah, that's a great idea. We haven't done that in a long time. It'll be super great and super fun. And Dan sent this article, which triggered me, um, which brings up our topic of the week. Is instructional design dead? Is it dead? Is it dead or is it useless? It could be. Either one, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, you know, I, I think I, I think the the article we're talking about, it's on aconventional.com. I think is the name of the blog by uh, Shackleton Jones. Uh, of course, dredging up came up on LinkedIn and uh, the, the title was Instructional design is useless. I mean, I can't think of a title more aimed at me to make sure I click on it. Uh, like, I think we joked that like the the title is is clickbait. Hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. So, like, I mean, but I like, clicked it, so it worked. Oh right? yeah, oh yeah, I mean, Same. definitely, hundred percent worked. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Mr. Jones or Shackleton, uh, good job, fantastic. I uh, definitely, definitely did what it was supposed to. I clicked on it and read it. Uh, I mean, like, I'm just, I'll jump right in. Uh, instructional design is useless. Short answer, no. Uh, long answer, sort of. Ooh. Could you do our audience a favor? Could you kind of, um, it's a real brief, brief thing. Could you go ahead and read some of it for him? That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, so basically, in the article, Shackleton comes through and he's like, hey, uh, he says, instructional design is useless. He says, there's two reasons why. The first is that it's folklore, that there's just myth and legend that propels some of the core fundamentals of instructional design. And the second one, and the one that probably hurts the most, is that uh, instructional design doesn't relate to learning. Uh, I don't want to read it word for word. I want you to go and click on the link. Scott, can we make sure we get it in like the, the show notes, the link to it? Oh, yeah. And Shackleton, uh, hopefully we'll reach out to you before this airs and say, hey, we talked about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the guy for in his defense, he taught learning theory. So the guy yeah. is not just saying this like he's a learning theorist and he's basically saying some things that I think are thought provoking. And that's great. The first one, which I think we could talk about, let's talk about it, that it's folklore. So how do we feel about instructional design being for folklore? Or what are some of the elements in within st instructional design that maybe you've been a part of that you maybe went back and go, eh, maybe could be a little right there so i think this is the part where i said at the beginning the long answer maybe um and again like i'm 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 just a blowhard on the internet like everybody else um but i think a lot of what we hold as the fundamentals of knowledge transfer and instructional design um are he says he says uh, ritual and i i sort of agree with him i think a lot of the things where we go this is how knowledge transfers and here are the things you must do to ensure that knowledge transfers are things that have come up and worked in very specific cases in specific places for specific people and then we go ta-da we've solved learning and i think the only group that has solved learning um, is Hollywood. Ooh, Hollywood? Ooh. How did Hollywood for those of you, solve? For those of you who can't see our faces, the look that Scott just gave <laughs> was fantastic. How has Hollywood solved learning? Yes. How many Marvel movies are there? A bunch. How many hours? Oh, my God. A year yeah. of my life, probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's a semester of work, right? Like, if you were going to take a class on it, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you could get a minor in Marvel and yes. whatever else you're yes. doing. Yes, 
And there are people uh, who know so much about these movies, the lore, the backstory, who are motivated to go out and learn more to set up their own knowledge management tools, whether they call them blog or whatever, who to learn about these characters that aren't real, to learn about the story and history, which won't make their jobs any better because they want to and they enjoy it. And there's learning moments in all of these movies. Uh, you can talk about the themes. You can talk about the facts and knowledge. You could talk about all the little bits of lore. But so many people carry so much of that with them. It takes up headspace for free. Oh, uh, Not even for free. You paid for this. You paid for these classes. You paid for this knowledge. And it has value beyond anything that any probably, you know, HR course you just took has. And I think the reason why is because we have tried to make learning a science instead of an art. Well, I'm going to jump into because... I'm I'm going to take a more literal perspective on what Dan just explained. And I think yeah. you did a great job, Dan. Very I think um, when you hear things like it's ritual, um, all these things about it, it becoming habit and commonplace. I, I think what's happened is we value rules over reason. And let me explain literally Boom. where I think that comes in. We've, you get in the habit of creating like process trainings, right? Teach people to click here and then click this button and then close this out or, or perform this activity. And then when it comes time to train people on a behavior, we think we can use the same approach because we found that if you put um, X amount of content on this page and then you follow with this, with this kind of question that it accomplishes the goal, but you're not thinking about the reasons or the, you know, the end goal of what you're trying to do and that a process training cannot be the same as a behavior training. But a lot of our, you know, trainings that we put together are based on the rules. So this is the flow we follow because it's successful and we're not thinking, but we're trying to accomplish a different goal. And I don't care how successful you were with all the, with the 20 other trainings you built. It's not going to work this time, but we get in that ritual and we believe in the ritual. And that's all we want to do. I became a much better instructional designer when I, be, when I started to be a learning experience designer. When I stopped being an instructional designer and started being an experience designer. Um, and it was a really tough transition. When I first got into instructional design, you know, I, I, I fell into it uh, through the grace and effort of uh, far smarter people who looked at me and said, yeah, that kid seems like he's got a, a good idea for what how this needs to work. And then I immediately messed it up by like, I have to learn everything about instructional design and I have to be an expert because I don't have the education chops to actually be here and open up my mouth and say things. So I'm going to learn everything there is to learn about adult learning theory, everything there is to learn about, you know, knowledge transfer and what it means on a scientific and psychological level. And I'm sure I was a giant jerk. In fact, I know I was a giant jerk. The trainings I made, people made fun of and got teased. And I would be, I could point to adult learner theories and be like, nope, I checked these boxes. This theory, this, <laughs> this, this training is good. And I don't know why you can't see it. Um, it wouldn't be until it would take me years to abandon that thinking because I was afraid of what my career looked like without the safety net of the ritual. Well, that is awesome. The first thing I want to say is that you're wrong. Tony Stark is a real person I know. So there it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, real <Fair>. stuff. <laughs> um, I, I love this idea of being a learning experience designer and, and learning experience development, um, Alex D., um, is a huge buzzword in our our circles, and I think it's I think it's fantastic. And I think that there is some validity around the. This is the process that I use when I create my learning. Um, that may be built built on theory, but it's also built on like this is what I know. And I think that one of the things that I would hope I would challenge the audience to think about, like, always be thinking about how can I do something differently. That that can be a challenge if I've got. 
two weeks to put together something that would normally take six to eight, right? So I'm always going to fall back to, okay, this is how we do it, right? So I think that that's important. You know, begin, Covey tells us this in Seven Habits. So you've got to begin with the end in mind. What's going to be yep. new, better or different when we're done? Like, so when we think about, like, Abby's great point, that process training is different than behavior training. I, I would totally agree. Like, the end results are different as well. And yet, how many of us put together leadership courses that are just basically nothing but a download of information that I can take and do stuff with? Um it's that experience that we have to build into things. And it's really interesting. I was, I was challenged this week to come up with examples of, of experience training so that we put together. And I, I'm looking at almost everything I put together. I'm like, well, everything I've got there has some component of that accountability. Like, how am I going to be measured? How am I going to um, be held accountable to the learning that I get today? So I think that's really important. But one of the things that, I I heard um, on the Learning Geeks podcast was this idea of learning learner styles, right? We've got kinesthetic learners, you got auditory learners, we've got you know visual learners, and we should design our learning to this. And I'm, if you're listening to this and you know what this is, and this is one of your check boxes, like you can go ahead and raise your hand. If you're driving down the road, make sure the hands on the wheel, right? So <laughs> no accidents, right? <laughs> Uh, disclaimer note, please keep both your hands on the driver wheel. <laughs> was that, it? was that, Dan, was that one of your check boxes? Is that like, I got to make sure I've got a, I got a learning that, that meets at least two out of three of those people. Cause no. that's important. No, I, I, I lucked out and, um, the, my mentor, the person who <clears throat> taught me instructional design was like, yeah, that's all BS. It's complete baloney. There's no scientific evidence of it at all. If it's in your checklist, fantastic, great. Just get the white white out and just kind of get rid of it. It's gone. Can can I can I jump in on that point though, real quick? For sure. I feel like in turning our heads away from that debunked learning theory, we've turned too far. And instead of like looking at something and knowing that, like, hey. I have to build for this person. I have to build for this person. I have to build for that person. I have to build for these learning types. We've said there's only one learning type and I've built content that applies to that one learning type. I feel like we've gone too far. And like, because of that, we've like turned our back on the opportunities that engaging the senses presents. Do I think that there are learning types like kinesthetic learners, audio learners? No. But I do think that in our abandonment and like, I'm going to say repudiation, that's my fancy word. I'm going to say repudiation of that idea that we have abandoned building true multimedia, true engaging learning because it's tough and it's hard. And when somebody gave us the scientific okay to stop building that way, we went, Oh, thank God. But I, but, but listen, why do we need to throw our learners into a bucket? Well, I don't want to spend too much time on this. It's just an example. But I, why do we need to put our learners into a bucket at, at all? It really is. We want to go back to it. It's the objective that we want to, we want to make sure happens, right? So we align on the objectives, what's going to be new, better, and different when we're done. And then how do we create an experience that leads to those objectives? And then can we measure that? And that's maybe the tough part. I think it's a little bit of a crutch to use all these learning types anyway, because I think at the end of the day, our focus should be getting to know your learners. And if you really know your learners, you're not sitting here going, okay, is this hitting my auditory learners? Is this hitting like, no, you're saying these folks, when I, when I got to know them, this is what they needed and this is how they want it. So if you are relying on these crutches of learning types and paradigms and all, you're not, you're not building for people, you know, you're just not. So I would encourage you, if you feel like you can't make decisions about how to build your training based on your audience, get to know them. You know, I, 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 I will say, I think there is a, a series of culprits behind the learning theater that where we find ourselves. 
And I think true learning and development professionals, true building true learning and development moments is incredibly difficult. It is something that takes experience and work and time. It's, you know, as we talk about like, is instructional design useless? And like, we, we banty about like, oh, maybe or no, or yes. <clears throat> the underpinning is that there are professionals in this field who are professionals who get this done, who can verifiably show knowledge transfer. And I think that the reason why we have this learning theater is because it is tough. It is hard. And companies sometimes have to decide, am I paying bonuses this year or am I paying learning and development people? And if I can hire a learning and development person for cheap who says, I know adult learner theory, I just left college, I can build this training and I can do it at half the cost of an experienced professional, well, that seems like a no-brainer. That seems like a, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Yes, hire that person. And I, I feel like that's kind of how we've gotten where we're at, where I know Bloom's taxonomy. I'm going to go ahead and you know follow through that, and I can show you, on, you know, through the ADDIE methodology how I'm going to follow up and ensure that this training works, and I can verify it before we roll out so there is little to no risk. And um, that's, uh, I don't want to uh, curse because, you know, we're a PG <laughs> podcast, but that's, I feel a lot of times that's baffling them with BS. And having been in a room sometimes, knowing that I would have to convince executives to do a difficult lift and to take extra time and extra resources to ensure responsible knowledge transfer before a difficult launch, I have used those words to bludgeon down a door and be like, I know my stuff. I know what I'm talking about. Here's some fancy words. Please give us the money we need to do this training. And they work. And I think that's how we've gotten into this place where it's like, let me tell you why the adding methodology is going to ensure that your learners are successful when like at best it's a guess. Yeah. Well, and I, to your point, Dan, and I talk to my team about this a lot. Um, it's something we focus on and care about it's, and by my team, I just mean like my counterparts. I don't lead a team. I work, I work on a team, but it's our responsibility to ensure that we are very difficult to replace and that the business knows that. So we better know our stuff. We better work really intentionally. We better educate ourselves and create great materials. But the other side of that coin is it's not the business's job to know that we've done these things. We've got to make sure the business understands the value we bring and that we're being proactive and adding value. Um, because Dan said they, they may find someone cheaper, but they may not. They may be willing to invest in someone more expensive if they think those people can prove that they're adding more value. So don't just think the company will go out trying to save money and replace you with someone not as talented. If somebody else can come into the room and say, this is what I can do for your business, and you've never done that for them, you're in a bad place. You just are. I totally agree. I totally agree. I, you know, you're, you know that's a good point. Like, good learning and development is the difference between success and failure for large scale launches. And, you know, businesses know that. That's why so many have learning and development. But there are some pretty big businesses that that don't have learning and development. There are some pretty big names that recently canned all their learning and development folks. <clears throat> TikTok. Um, which, you know, definitely was like one of those things that I like an article I read that like sent a shiver up my spine, like, oh God, what does that mean? Um but, and I think that takes us to the other half of this article. The second is that it doesn't relate to learning. And that's the part that I, I, I strongly disagree with. That instructional design may be full of ritual and secret magic words, but it most certainly relates to learning. It's why most of the people are in the field and learning and knowledge transfer happens on its own. You don't 
need instructional design for somebody to learn something, but you do need instructional design for a large group of people to learn large swaths of information at a reasonable and acceptable rate. Yeah. And so Dan, you said when you first started, like you learned all the rules and you did all the things. And I think a lot of people, when they come into um, design and we've seen it, right? We've had how many guests who said they came from some other random part of the business into oh, yeah. learning. I sure as heck did. Yeah. And they, the first thing they, that a lot of us do, we download the decks and the templates that our teams are using. Right. And we learn how to use the decks and templates and we r repeat what everyone's been doing. That's not inherently evil. Okay. You're not committing no. some learning crime. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like you have to start You're somewhere. You're going to learning jail, <laughs> which, yeah. You're just, right. You got to meet the needs of the business. And if the needs of the business are, I need this training tomorrow. Right. I'm going to case it. I'm going to copy and steal everything. I'm going to okay, absolutely great. just change but, the color here and a word there. We're good. Solid. Right. There you go. Right? <laughs> but part of what you should be casing, and Scott knows this, and Dan knows this because they've done it. You go to the people or the groups who've been using them a long time or who made them and go, talk to me about what this is doing and why. Why is it built this way? What would you change if you were going to do it again? Or if this, or if your objective was different? Um, where do you start? Do you start with the template or do you start with a conversation? That's the difference between someone who's just in there to fill a role and someone who wants to grow in the industry, I think. One of the very first things I, I told new instructional designers after I hired them and brought them to my team was, tell me what you want to build today. What do you want to build and what does it look like to you? Because if you don't know, you'll be building other people's stuff for a long, long time. And there are, I, I know plenty of instructional designers who went, I, I don't know. I'll just, just, you know, hand me a template. And I get that because like walking without walking on the tightrope without a net is scary. But I know plenty of instructional designers who are amazing, who are the best, who went, well, I've always wanted to build this weird random thing. And I'm like, great. I don't know how we're going to make that work yet, but let's get started. Let's figure that out. Because if you don't do that, Day one, week one, month one, pretty soon somebody like me is going to have to say, okay, cool. Well, we've uh, gone through the ramp period and I think you really understand like how the business works and where we're at. So here are our templates. Here's how we expect things to be built and go. And that's where Addy and Blooms and all that other stuff falls in because those are the foundations that businesses and the military and education sector have built how they do knowledge transfer. Like they, they exist because they, they were the foundation chosen by other people to build. And if you step into a learning development role, I highly advise you to start building what you think you should to do knowledge transfer ASAP day one, because you'll quickly find the walls and the walls are often much further out than what people believe they are. So I want to piggyback off of that. Cause I, you bring up something that I am really passionate about. Like if you're an ID, you know, it is the design part of it is, is one thing. The advocacy part of it is another thing. So what I mean by that is like, I come into any opportunity where people are asking for something. I am the advocate for my audience, right? So my audience yes. has to go through this experience, whatever it is. And it's got to make sense and it's got to be relevant because if it doesn't make sense and if it's not relevant, I'm out. And then all this time is wasted and it's not effective. And so one of the things that we have to constantly be doing is you walk in with an attitude of collaboration as an advocate for your audience and always always be asking questions always that's where our intellectual capital shows up that's where our leadership capital shows up help me understand why you want to add a voiceover track to a powerpoint deck and turn it into a video why because i'm going to tell you what from an audience perspective that is a terrible experience and it's not going to achieve what you want to and I don't have a lot of time to just put myself checking off boxes to make myself 
feel good, like I'm adding value, because that is the quickest way to be out of a job. We add value by being advocates for partnership, being advocates for our audience and asking questions and then thinking outside the box. Thoughts? I'm yeah, a hundred percent. Like, yeah. like, so I don't want to like, I, I, mm, no, I, I'm gonna, um, <laughs> being a learning and development expert is for me, a, a role of passion. It's one of the things that when I finally got here, I was like, holy crap, this is what I was meant to do. And so the trust placed in me to be an advocate for my learners is paramount. I can't tell you how many times like I've gone to bat and been like, hey, I don't really know if this is what's really what's best for like this audience. And this is why. And you don't win every one of those fights. But that's that's the difference between. Oh, let me rephrase that. That's what separates good instructional designers from great, in my opinion, is that sense of advocacy, that sense of like that, that trust placed in me by others. Because. If I don't build a good experience and you don't get this knowledge, maybe you're out of a job. You can't live the life you want to because I couldn't tell you which button to press when somebody was upset on a phone call or something silly like that. It seems silly, but like all of these things, all of these, all of these knowledge transfers, all these learning moments serve a greater purpose. And people will poo poo because it's like it's to keep a job or it's to learn when Columbus sailed across the ocean or whatever, because it's like, oh, it's just facts. Like, what are you going to do with it? Like, I just looked up on my phone, but that knowledge transfer serves a greater purpose in letting people explore their lives and gives them the tools and capabilities to grow beyond where they're at. So I don't know how anyone's supposed to follow Dan on that, but, um, I'm just going to change the topic a little awesome. bit awesome. because yeah, Dan, yeah. you nailed it. So this is my challenge to you and Scott. I would love to know what you guys would say to leaders who are not in L and D, but lead L and D teams or hire L and D teams or are um, asking difficult L and D questions. What do they need to be thinking about when they're trying to decide, am I keeping my internal team or am I hiring consultants? And I want to caveat this by saying, I don't think hiring external L&D professionals is a bad idea. There are a lot of times when it's the right idea. Um, and I know a lot of our audience that rings tr true for them. So Scott, Dan, how would you help your leaders ask those questions? Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a spicy question. I like that question. Scott, you want to jump in first? Wow. Thanks for the loaded question. Um, <laughs> it's definitely a loaded question. It's a way loaded question because on one hand, it's like, it, it, I'll just tell you where I'm at. Like, okay, so you want to bring some L&D consultants in. Okay, cool. What am I not doing? Right. So help me understand the current situation beyond my understanding of it, which would ask you to do this, right? So where is the business at and what is new or different about those things in the business that I need to understand so that I can provide value. Like that is what I need to know immediately because I want to know right away if I'm doing what you expect me to do or if I'm not. Um, listen, I'm never against bringing people in to help, but I need to have a better understanding of what's not working, right? Because that's why you bring people in to help, right? So you, no one goes to a marriage counselor because they have a great marriage. I mean, that, that, well, I shouldn't say that. There are some right? Crazy people that do that. But for the most part, I'm going to go to go see a marriage counselor because I want a better marriage. And right. So I'm going to go get somebody who's an expert at this and get some help. Or maybe there's a situation at work that, um, Hey, listen, we want to dive into this new metaverse, right? We want to really learn VR and we've never done that. Have you done that? No. Okay. Well, let's get some help. Right. Great. So I need to have a better understanding of the lay of the land, what's working, what's not working when, and what's new or different, you know, when I move forward. Right. So that's where I'm going to want to be like, and, and do it in a very humble way. Like this is not, 
I, there's always an opportunity for me to get better. So I want to know, you know, hey, is this a performance thing? Because if it is, let's talk about that, right? Because I need to know that. If if well, if all you see is me doing the templates that that my team needs to fill out, and we're not moving the needle, and no one's talking about it, and no one seems to care, that's a great conversation. If the business is changing and we need to be figuring that out, well, that's a different conversation. Both conversations are important. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Dan, what uh, about you? What do you think? You know, I I think, Scott, you're talking about a sense of like fear and doubt. And I think a lot of learning and development professionals have that. Like we've talked about this a lot on this podcast. We've had experts come on to talk more about this, but actual hard metrics in learning and development are notoriously difficult. And so this fear of like, am I, am I providing value? Am I, am I, am I enough is something that can creep into anybody as you're talking about talking to executives to get them buy-in for more learning and development resources or more focus on learning and development or, you know, the contractors or outside assistants. I think the root of that question, and correct me if I'm wrong, is how do we prove L&D's value enough to realistically and depending, dependably expand when we need to. If there are plenty of times in my past where I've had leaders be like, hey, we can hire an outside group. And in my past, I've been like, no, 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 we have enough talent in-house to get it done. And many times we have gotten it done, but it has taken so much to lift and do that we've had to stop focusing on other projects and other things. And those things still got done, but at the expense of life and value and time. And I think there are lots of businesses out there that want to put in more time and effort into, into learning development of their people, which is fantastic. And you get to a place where it's like, am I ready to create a new headcount to spend a bunch of money to take a lot of time to find the right person, bring them on, and then spend a lot more time to ramp them up and make them proficient and get them here. And I think a lot of times most businesses say, no, um, that's, that's four months of work. So I guess we'll just have to do without. And it's cases like that where I think as a leader, you're okay to say, can we just bring in a contractor then? Can we just bring in somebody for a few months to get us over this hump? And then when the status quo is set and you've had that person and you're like able to like get more stuff done, you can say, as a leader, you can leverage that and say, we've had this contractor for four months, their contract's running out soon. Can we extend it? Or Here's the value of that headcount. I think as a learning and development leader, that puts you in a fantastic place to talk about the value of learning and development. Because now you've had somebody, the business already was willing to spend some money to get somebody here. You can say, great, look at everything else we got done on top of our you know, keys. We got this extra stuff done. This extra stuff wouldn't exist without this extra person. And now that I can talk to you about the value of this extra person in the form of project completion, we can talk metrics. Right. Well, it's one of the things I think you should always have in your back pocket. And if you don't have that in your back pocket, actually forget about the back pocket, the front pocket, like you should have your story, right? This is, this is the result of the efforts that we have. Like if you don't got a story with that, um, and if you could put some numbers to it, that's great. So if you got a leadership training and it reduces, you know, employee turnover, great. How do you tie that in? What's your percentage of that? What's where, where's the value? Oh, by the way, um, leaders love dollar values. Like you can go ahead and turn that into, you know, your percentage into a dollar value for the organization. That's fantastic. You have to have that. If you don't have that, you need to get it today. 
right? And if you can't, for whatever reason, create that, then you need to take a look at what you're doing for the business and find a way to, to create it. It's just gotta, you, you just gotta have that. If you don't have it, then everything Dan talks about, like how do I show the value for my contractor? How do I show the value of learning development for our business? None of that means anything to individuals that are looking at, you know, bottom line impact for the business, right? So figure that out, figure that story and have it. Um, and if you need to build something so you can tell a story like that, start to put together visions for that today and start selling that up today. Like you've got to have a vision of how we can tell that story. Because if you're just the vending machine for feel good activities, and trust me, been there, done that far too much in my career. Like here, here we need this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And then, well, you know, what kind of impact did you have? I don't know. I have no idea what kind of impact, but we got the work done. Not the right answer, right? So either you've got that story, you're working on that story, or you're building an environment where you can tell that story um, because it's super important. And I think a lot of folks, like I came out of sales into training. A lot of folks came from different parts of the business. There was a reason you made that jump. And it's probably because you understood that you could help somebody or that you could do something for the business because of the experience you had in your other role. Don't discount that. Don't think that that <laughs> that saying, well, I worked in sales and I know this is what they need. And that's what I put into all my trainings. That's adding value. That's part of oh, your 100%, story. 100%. So yeah, trust, trust that. Your motivations for the role you chose are probably honest, real motivations for what you keep doing every day. And that's okay to put that into your story over and over and over again. It's real and, um, and it matters. So I, I still, when I go into meetings about projects that are launching where they haven't even talked about training yet, they just have us in there because it's big and they've kind of got everyone in the room. My wheels are turning like, if I was out in the field, what would I need? Or, hey, we've had this cool thing we've, we've been learning how to do. Is this the right time to do it? Like, I'm hungry to, to put things into the mix that I think we can, we can help here. We can do something um, and pay attention to those instincts. And as you get into those projects, don't let that get lost in the mire. So to circle us back to where we started, because I think we've gone a field, which is great. But let me ask you guys, Scott, Abby, is instructional design useless? Yeah, I would say it serves the same functionality that grammar does in literature. That's what I would say. Ooh, I love that answer. I'm stealing that. I also say that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, help me understand when you mean grammar and literature. Like it's just like this necessary function that helps explain, help me, help me understand your analogy a little bit better. So I think you have to have a backbone, a structure that everyone can, um, like a foundation for a message mm -hmm. um, that if people can't understand what you're saying because they don't understand how it's written, the, the message is lost, right? So you have to have a way to convey a message, but the message itself is probably different. It's a separate part. I, yeah, I think I heard somebody describe grammar as uh, the way that Americans and British people can still communicate is because of grammar. Like if I read a sentence written by somebody in England and a sentence written by somebody in America, the structure of grammar will hold it together. So I still know what's being said. And the same thing across the United States. And I think for much of the English speaking world, that grammar builds a structure so we're all writing the same language. And yeah, I think that equates really well to instructional design. Wow, that's really great. I really like that. <laughs> Should we put it on a shirt? Let's put it on a shirt. <laughs> yeah, we put that on a shirt. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, hey, listen, we've been talking a long time about all this, and I think it's great. And um, I would certainly encourage our audience to join in the discussion. This is one of those times where emails as follow-ups would be fantastic. Before we wrap up, is there anything that we maybe didn't talk about that you think is really important you want to add to this discussion? I would say if you're not already kind of having these conversations in your head with yourself, 
maybe you take a step back and try and decide what your future really is in L&D. And I don't mean that critically. Um, there are a lot of great people who maybe it's time to move into a different role and take your experience you've had in L&D into something else. Or maybe L&D has been a good starting place for you to move um, like in a totally different direction. Maybe you like, discovered, oh, this is not where my passion is. I think if your passion really is in L&D, you've had some of these thoughts and conversations with yourself. Um, and so I'd either encourage you to like expound on those or to say, if I'm not having them, maybe this is not right. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, practice mindfulness. I mean, yeah, like a hundred percent. This thought isn't bad. This thought and this fear and this worry is like, it, you know, is, is my title useless? Uh, for some people can be really shaking. I mean, it's a hot button issue. It's said, you know, to to kind of like shake and rattle some cages. And so if it shook and rattle yours, good. But don't throw it away because you're scared of it. Really think about it. Think what it means. Think about the nooks and crannies. And find where you maybe agree with this and find where you definitely don't agree with this. At the end of the day, I mean, we, you know, if you're building learning material, you're helping people learn, you're transferring knowledge. That's what's important. The titles, the methodologies, all the other stuff is secondary. They're supposed to be the tools that help you get it done. But a carpenter who builds a sculpture of a bear with a chainsaw and a chisel, it doesn't matter which they chose. All you see at the end is the, the bear. That's a weird analogy, but I'm going to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Scott? Oh, yeah. 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 So there's a there's a little, um, <sighs> little thing I learned many years ago. It's called can I constant and never ending improvement, right? Covey talks about this is sharpening the saw. Like you should always, always, always be on this never ending quest. Life is this never ending quest to get better. No matter how good I am today, I have an opportunity to be better tomorrow. And I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind all the time. And I'm going to give you a little dirty secret. Like it's super fun to get better. And I think that that's what this article is really saying. Like, if, wait a minute, I'm not useless. Are you doing the same thing over and over and over and getting nothing but the same results? Like that's insanity. Einstein tells us that, right? So step out of your comfort zone and try to be better, right? There are opportunities for you to learn and grow everywhere. I get hit up with Oh my gosh, Training Magazine, if you don't send me 100 emails every day of the things that I can learn, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, th There are opportunities to learn and grow and get better all the time. There are people that you get to go out and network and learn and grow and get better all the time. So if you're not challenging your effectiveness, if you're not challenging how you add value, not just to your team, but your business, but to your own personal growth and development, you're not engaging in this thing that we call life and what a wonderful place to be in learning and development where i think that's kind of like our goal right so how do we get things to be better how do we how do we help people grow how, how do i grow right so take that moment take a step back and look at holistically what we're trying to say which is hey in this world where we try to help people get better you can do it too what are you doing to ensure that you're on top of it and you're adding value. What are you going to throw away, right? Give to goodwill, throw out these things and get rid of it. And then what are you going to invest in? And by personal investment, right? I can improve what I do. And if you do it humbly and you bring in great people and you learn from them, that's fantastic. Before the show, I was saying, you know, one of the things that I love, this is my favorite time of the week, but because I get together with people that uh, that I love and care about, and that's great. But the best part about this venture for me is that I've met so many amazing people that have challenged me, that have helped me learn and grow. And I got to tell you straight up, I'm better at my job today than I was a year ago because of that. So folks, if you're new, there's a whole catalog of really great people you need to listen to and connect with and, and, um, and be challenged by so that you can deliver 
better results. And that's what I love about learning. Learning people are great people. Um, our hearts are in it. I haven't met very, I've met very few that, um, that are not amazing people. And so learn from them, connect from them. We all want to help you grow. We all want to help you get better. That's my rant of the week. There it is. So Danielson. Yes, Scott. Could you do us a favor and let our audience know how they connect with us? Absolutely. All right, party people. We would love to know your thoughts on is instructional design useless? I mean, honest to goodness, we'd love to know any of your thoughts about any learning and development stuff, but specifically this week about instructional design. You can email us at learningnerdcast at gmail.com. Join in on the discussion. Ask us questions. We want to know. If you're on Facebook, you can find us at Learning Nerds. And lastly, for all of our Instagram peeps, Fab Learning Nerds. Scott. Thanks, Dan. Hey, everybody, do me a favor. Could you hit that subscribe button? Share this episode with your friends. If you're getting it on a podcatcher like iTunes or Stitcher, we'd love to get a review from you. Let us know how well we're doing. Let us know how much of an opportunity we have. We'd love to be able to get better, and it helps get more of what we do out to all of you. With that, I'm Scott. I'm Dan. And I'm Abby. And we're your fabulous learning nerds, and we are out. Oh.